Hi, I'm Dr. Jennifer Shuford. I'm a specialist in infectious diseases. Let's begin with an overview of cell wall inhibitors and bacterial infections. Cell wall inhibitors are antimicrobial drugs that inhibit the synthesis of the cell wall. Mammalian cells lack this structure, and so it makes it an ideal target for antibacterials. Cell walls are made of peptidoglycan, which is a polymer of glycan sub subunits that are joined by peptide crosslinks. These drugs can be divided into the beta-lactams and the non-beta-lactam cell wall inhibitors. Beta-lactams are named for the beta-lactam ring that's in their structure, and this includes several classes of antimicrobials. It includes the penicillins, which is the prototype beta-lactam, and there's a whole class of antibiotics that have been developed from penicillin. Cephalosporins are another beta-lactam cell wall inhibitor. And there are four generations of cephalosporins that we'll be talking about. There's the carbapenems and also the monobactams. And those four classes of drugs are the beta-lactam cell wall inhibitors that we'll be discussing. We'll also be discussing beta-lactamase inhibitors. Since bacterial resistance to beta-lactams is a large and growing problem, we'll discuss these beta-lactamase inhibitors separately. And then we'll discuss non-beta-lactam cell wall inhibitors. And the one you might be most familiar with is vancomycin. All right, let's begin our talk about cell wall inhibitors. And first we'll be discussing the beta-lactam cell wall inhibitors and we'll begin with the penicillins. So let's talk about this structure. There's a six amino penicillinic acid residue um, that forms the basis of these uh, penicillin drugs. And the beta-lactam ring is a part of this residue. There's also the R side chain. And this R side chain affects the antibacterial spectrum, the stability to the stomach acid, as well as the susceptibility to bacterial enzymes, such as beta-lactamases. All right, now let's discuss the mechanism of action of the penicillins. These drugs interfere with the final step of bacterial wall synthesis, which is the cross-linkage step. It's also known as transpeptidation. And this leaves the cell membrane exposed. By leaving that cell membrane exposed, the cells will lyse by osmotic pressure or via autolysis. The beta-lactams are bactericidal generally. And let's discuss for a second bactericidal versus bacteriostatic. You'll hear me talk about these, um, these characteristics as we go through the different um, antibacterial agents. Bactericidal means that that drug causes the bacteria to die. It's bactericidal. Bacteriostatic means that that drug keeps that bacteria from replicating. And so it suppresses or controls the infection and allows the host immune system to then clear up um, that infection. And so that's the two um, mechanisms of action that, a, uh, that these drugs will have. It's generally on a continuum where under certain circumstances of the bacteria or the concentrations of the drug, one drug may be bacteriostatic in some situations and bactericidal in other situations. Um, and so it is a, con a continuum. But in general, these beta-lactam drugs, specifically penicillins, are uh, bactericidal. Now, these cell wall inhibitors that we'll be talking about are only effective against actively growing or dividing bacteria. And so it is one limitation of these drugs. All right, now let's talk about the site of action. So how does that penicillin actually inhibit the, wall, the uh, cell wall formation? It does this by binding to penicillin binding proteins. Penicillin binding proteins are enzymes that are found um, within the cell in the periplasmic space. And this, um, these enzymes are involved in the synthesis of the cell wall, as well as the maintenance of the morphological features of that bacteria. Antibiotics that bind the penicillin binding protein can not only just prevent the cell wall synthesis, but also lead then to morphological changes or lysis of those susceptible bacteria. And so as you might suspect, alterations in this penicillin binding protein um, will provide that bacteria with a resistance mechanism. And so this is one way that bacteria can become resistant to antibiotics is by changing the, the binding site. For penicillins, that's the penicillin binding protein. And this is exactly how MRSA becomes resistant to methicillin by changing that binding protein.
All right, let's talk a little bit about the inhibition of transpeptidase. Some penicillin binding proteins catalyze the formation of cross linkages between the peptidoglycan chains. And penicillins inhi inhibit this transpeptidase catalyzed reaction and therefore hinder the formation of these cross links, which is really central to the integrity of their cell wall. Bacteria also produce degradative enzymes called idle autolysins, and these participate in the normal remodeling of the bacterial cell wall. So just like in our bones where we have osteoblasts and osteoclasts that work together to remodel the bone, um, bacteria also have autolysins that can help degrade parts of the cell wall, and then there's a cell wall synthesis going on, and this helps them um, remodel their cell wall. But in the presence of penicillin, what we have is inhibition of that cell wall synthesis, and it appears some activation of the autolysins, and therefore we can um, use penicillins to really break down that cell wall and, and um, have cell wall destruction in these bacteria. Let's talk about antibacterial spectrum of the penicillins. The antibacterial spectrum of the penicillins is determined in part by their ability to actually cross that bacterial cell wall and to then uh, reach the penicillin binding proteins that are in that periplasmic space between the cell wall and the inner plasma membrane. And this um, crossing of the cell wall can be determined by the size of the drug that we're administering, its charge, as well as its hydrophobicity. In general, the gram-positive microorganisms have cell walls that are easily crossed by penicillins. However, gram-negative microorganisms have an outer lipopolysaccharide membrane, or an envelope, surrounding the cell that presents a barrier to water-soluble substances, and in this case, the penicillins. The gram-negative bacteria, however, also usually have proteins inserted into that lipopolysaccharide envelope that act as water-filled channels, and these are called porins, and these do permit some transmembrane entry. And of special note, Pseudomonas aeruginosa lacks these porins, and that's one reason why they're just intrinsically resistant to some antimicrobials. We're going to be talking about uh, Pseudomonas aeruginosa a lot. Pseudomonas aeruginosa causes a lot of infections, especially in people who are in the hospital or have chronic illnesses. Um, Pseudomonas has a lot of um, resistance against multiple antimicrobials, and so it's become a real nuisance to uh, to physicians who are trying to treat patients with infections. Um, and so you'll, you'll hear us talk about uh, Pseudomonas aeruginosa specifically multiple times in this lecture. Penicillins also have synergy with aminoglycosides. Because cell wall synthesis inhibitors alter the permeability of bacterial um, cells, these drugs, the cell wall inhibitors, can facilitate the entry of other antimicrobials, and in this case, an aminoglycoside. Um, and which may not ordinarily have access to the inside of these bacteria. So together they can work synergistically. Let's talk about some of the types of penicillins. All right, first we have the natural penicillins. And these, um, the natural penicillins are comprised of penicillin G and penicillin V. Now these drugs were obtained from the fermentation, uh, from fermentations of the mold Penicillium chrysogenum. Other penicillins, other than penicillin V and penicillin G, are called semi-synthetic, and it's because different R groups have been synthesized um, to be attached to that 6-amino penicillinic acid residue that's obtained actually from that penicillium mold. Penicillin G is an injectable form of penicillin, and it's used for a number of infections. It's used for gram-positive cocci, including strept uh, streptococcus pneumoniae and streptococcus pyogenes. It's used for gram-negative cocci, including Neisseria species. Some gram-positive bacilli, including Bacillus anthracis, as well as Carinibacterium diphtheriae, and then spirochetes. Um, and the one that we use penicillin um, a lot for still is Treponema pallidum, or the agent for syphilis. Now, penicillin originally had activity against all of these. There has been a lot of resistance um, that has been incorporated into these bacteria, and so that penicillin doesn't always work against these species now, but originally this was the spectrum that they had, um, that penicillin had, and we can still use it for some sensitive um, isolates within these species. Now penicillin V is the oral formulation of the natural penicillin, and it has a spectrum that's similar to penicillin G. It's not usually used for the treatment of bacteremia, 
because of its higher minimum bactericidal concentration. So when penicillin is taken orally there, it doesn't reach as high concentrations in the blood as an injectable form does, and so it's not a reliable treatment for bacteremia. And like I mentioned, penicillin's use is increasingly limited by resistance. But this is not a new problem. Um, resistance has been emerging to penicillin since it first attained wide use in the 1940s. About one to two years after introducing penicillin, it was already described in the literature that, that um, staphylococci, staph aureus, was developing resistance to penicillin. And so the anti-staphylococcal penicillins were developed, and these include methicillin, nafcillin, oxacillin, and dicloxacillin. Now these are penicillinase-resistant penicillins. These block the action of penicillinases, and penicillinases are just some of the, the larger group beta-lactamases. The use of these anti-staphylococcal penicillins is restricted to the treatment of infections caused by penicillinase-producing staphylococci. They do have activity against streptococci, streptococci and staphylococci, um, but their, their use is still limited by um, resistance within these, um, these groups of bacteria. Like we've discussed, resistant strains of staphylococci are becoming increasingly common, and one that, we've, uh, that you've probably heard a lot about is MRSA, methicillin-resistant staph aureus. Um, but in this case, MRSA is not mediated, the, the resistance there is not mediated by a penicillinase, but mediated by a change, an altered um, penicillin binding protein. But there are many um, isolates of Staph aureus which also uh, produce the penicillinase, um, and so that's why these drugs were originally developed. Now, I mentioned methicillin as the first of those anti-staphylococcal anti penicillins, and really because of its toxicity, methicillin isn't used clinically, but it is still used in the lab to identify MRSA, to identify um, strains of staph aureus that are resistant to our, um, the anti-staphylococcal penicillins. MRSA is usually susceptible to vancomycin, a trimethoprim sulfa and um, rifampin, and so these are the agents that you probably use against MRSA and not these anti-staphylococcal penicillins. So when these anti-staphylococcal penicillins were developed, what they did is increase the uh, potential use of these penicillins against staphylococci, um, particularly the ones that produce penicillinase, but they still didn't have gram-negative coverage. And so what we see here is that the extended spectrum penicillins were developed. These are also called the amino penicillins, and they include ampicillin and amoxicillin. Now these drugs have a spectrum that's similar to penicillin G, but have added activity against gram-negative bacteria. Some Notable things about this group of, of the penicillins is that ampicillin is the drug of choice for gram-positive bacillus uh, listeria monocytogenes. Um, in clinical practice, you'll see this come up, um, that you need coverage of listeria monocytogenes for elderly patients, for infants, um, especially in the case of suspected meningitis. And so um, we'll be talking about which antibiotics actually cover listeria, and ampicillin is the drug of choice for listeria monocytogenes. Both amoxicillin amp and ampicillin are still widely used for the treatment of uncomplicated respiratory infections. And amoxicillin is employed prophylactically by dentists and oral surgeons for patients who are undergoing extensive dental procedures or oral surgery procedures um, in the presence of an abnormal heart valve. Resistance to these antibiotics is now a major clinical problem because inactivation of these drugs by a plasma-mediated penicillinase or a plasma-mediated beta-lactamase. And so because of this, E. coli, Escherichia coli, and Haemophilus influenza are frequently resistant to the amino penicillins. However, we can overcome this resistance by formulation with a beta-lactamase inhibitor. And so amoxicillin can be paired with clavulanic acid, and ampicillin can be paired with solbactam, and this will extend their antimicrobial spectrum, and that's just by adding a beta-lactamase inhibitor. And we'll talk about these again separately later in the lecture. So when um, the amino penicillins were developed, they did add some gram-negative coverage to that classic gram-positive coverage that the penicillins had had previously. However, there was still a hole in that coverage where it did not cover Pseudomonas aeruginosa. 
And so the anti-pseudomonal penicillins were then developed. So the drugs that are included with the anti-pseudomonal penicillins include carbenicillin, ticarcillin, and piperacillin. These are also called carboxypenicillins and uridopenicillins. And piperacillin is the most potent of this uh, group of antibiotics. So let's talk about the antibacterial spectrum of these anti-pseudomonal penicillins. These are active against Pseudomonas aeruginosa and effective against many gram-negative bacilli um, besides Pseudomonas. It's not effective against Klebsiella because Klebsiella has a constitutive penicillinase. However, most of the time these drugs are not given without being paired uh, with a beta-lactamase inhibitor. So when these um, ticarcillin and piperacillin are paired with beta-lactamase inhibitors, ticarcillin is usually combined with clavulanic acid and piperacillin with tazobactam. And with that co-formulation, um, it really extends the antimicrobial spectrum and includes the Klebsiella. So clinically, um, you will be using this, uh, these agents paired with um, beta-lactamase inhibitors under most circumstances. And so you can expect broad spectrum um, coverage, especially with the gram negatives. Now let's pause for a moment and review the material that was just covered. Before we do that, if you haven't already done so, this might be a good time to read your pharmacology text that corresponds to the material that was just discussed. Then together, we'll go through the quick review in the study guide. Next! One week, sore throat, fever, and swollen glands in the neck. Say, ah! Uh, ah. Uh. Group A strep, amoxicillin! Next! Well, uh, it was about a week ago, I was coming back from visiting my Aunt Martha in Cleveland, and I was sitting on the plane, minding my own business, and here is this kid with sneezing and coughing, and a few days later, I began to sneeze and cough, started to feel all achy, and I have a lot of drainage. Sounds viral! Well, my kids have all had ear infections. I don't have an earache, but I'm thinking maybe it's a sinus infection, something like that. Moradity, next! Uh, are you sure? My nose has been stopped up. Pseudoephedrine, next! Uh, how about a Z-Pack? I mean, those have worked in the past. No pills for you! Next! Hi, I'm Dr. Chris Lewis. It's time for your quick review number one. Let's get started. What are the most common uses for penicillin G? Is penicillin G IV or oral? That's our IV version, remember? Well, the first uh, use is for syphilis, a very dangerous disease, and uh, we still use our good old-fashioned penicillin G for that. Uh, we also use this during labor for group B strep prevention in uh, the neonate. So a mom will be tested for group B strep in the prenatal care, and if she comes up positive, then we like to treat uh, uh, during labor uh, for that group B strep. And then one, it's not necessarily an IV form, but an IM form. So oftentimes for a group A strep pharyngitis, so for a strep throat, uh, we will still use an IM version of penicillin G. It's penicillin G benzathin. Moving on, which penicillinase inhibitor, uh, also known as beta-lactamase inhibitors, uh, is combined uh, with the following agents to create a drug with an extended spectrum of coverage? So, um, we've got four uh, drugs here. It's good to know these, these uh, combinations. So amoxicillin is often combined with clavulanic acid. And though it may not be important for your pharmacology test, uh, you should probably still know that the branded version is called Augmentin. Ampicillin is combined with Sulbactam, and this forms Unison. And this is often used in uh, surgery cases. If you have a, a surgical infection, uh, a surgeons like to use this preoperatively and sometimes postoperatively as well. Uh, Ticarcillin is combined with clambulanic acid as well, and it makes timentin. And piperacillin is combined with tazobactam, uh, and it forms zosin, which is a, a nice antibiotic that's used in patients for severe infections. Next, which drugs are used to, to treat MRSA, so methicillin-resistant Staph aureus? Uh, Big-time bacteria, uh, it's all over the world. Uh, you will run into it almost daily. Uh, if you are an uh, infectious disease specialist uh, or if you're an internist in the hospital. So the ones that we use most often, vancomycin, and we use vancomycin mainly for our serious MRSA infections. Uh, TMP-SMX or Bactrim 
is often used as an outpatient antibiotic. Oftentimes when we see uh, staph uh, skin infections, we'll use TMP-SMX. And then rifampin, don't use that one quite as often anymore since we have these other medications. One that uh, wasn't mentioned by Dr. Schufer that we should probably mention is uh, linizolid. Uh, and this is a uh, protein synthesis inhibitor, so it's not part of our cell wall inhibitors, but you should probably know that for MRSA. Uh, and it binds to the 23S RNA. And this is a great med that you should uh, be aware of because it's an oral medication. So uh, um, it'll treat MRSA and uh, VRE. So uh, a lot of times when people have serious MRSA infections, they're confined to the hospital. They have to be on vancomycin, and it can be uh, uh, you know, inconvenient for patients and expensive uh, for healthcare. But the nice thing about linizolid is that uh, it can be taken outpatient. So you can send your patients home who have uh, uh, potentially serious but controlled MRSA uh, infections uh, on an outpatient basis. Which bacteria uh, that causes endocarditis is associated with dental procedures? So Dr. Schubert mentioned this uh, in, her, in her lecture, uh, endocarditis due to dental procedures. What's the, the bacteria in the mouth that, that's causing this? Well, it's Viridin streptococci. So uh, remember uh, strep viridins or Viridin streptococci uh, as your endocarditis bug associated with dental procedures. Match the following antibiotics to their major action. So let's start with amoxicillin. Well, that's an extended spectrum uh, antibiotic, also known as an amino penicillin. Vancomycin has MRSA coverage. Nafcillin uh, is an uh, anti-staphylococcal, but not MRSA. Piperacillin is an anti-pseudomonal. And then clavulanic acid is our beta-lactamase inhibitor. Next. What bacteria, bacteria are covered by the extended spectrum penicillins? Um, so this is usually amoxicillin uh, or ampicillin, uh, and we use these all the time. So you should really know the, the, what spectrum these things are covering. So first it's covering gram-positive bacteria. So similar to penicillin, it's going to get a lot of your gram-positive uh, bugs. But the reason why we call them extended spectrum is because they cover gram-negatives as well, especially gram-negative rods. So there's a nice mnemonic that we use called HELPS, H-E-L-P-S. And it'll uh, stand for all the uh, gram-negative rods that this will cover. So Haemophilus influenza, E. coli, Listeria, Proteus mirabilis, Salmonella, and Enterococci. So remember those, remember HELPS uh, for your extended spectrum amino penicillins. A four-year-old patient uh, presents with a painful otitis media. What is the treatment of choice? Well, uh, if you go into primary care at all, you're going to run into this all the time. Uh, the, the, still, the, the treatment of choice is uh, amoxicillin or amino penicillins. And uh, if you get a treatment failure, so if you use your amoxicillin or may if they've used amoxicillin in the last 30 days and they've had a treatment failure or recurrence of their otitis media, uh, then you can switch to uh, the second uh, line medications, and those include amoxicillin with clavulanic acid. So remember we talked about that before, that's Augmentin. Uh, or you can use a third generation cephalosporin. There's one that uh, tastes pretty good that's oral called Omnicef or a Ceftonir, uh, and you can use those as well if you're failing your amoxicillin. Next, a hospitalized patient has a gram stain that shows gram positive cocci in clusters in the blood. Uh, what antibiotic should be started? So this is a great question. This brings in uh, a lot of different things that you should know. So first thing we need to know is our microbiology. So gram-positive cocci in clusters. So that immediately should make you think of Staph aureus. Sometimes it's referred to as a cluster of grapes. But anytime you hear cocci in clusters and gram-positive, you, you should think uh, Staph aureus. So this is in the blood, so we need to make some, some good decisions here. So if you've got something like this in the blood, I didn't give you any, any other information in this question about how sick they are, but they certainly have the potential to be very sick because they've got Staph aureus in their blood. So, um, so you, we would want to treat this person relatively quickly. So we have to make an assumption here that they have MRSA, methicillin-resistant Staph aureus, uh, until we get uh, our tests back confirming what's the resistance uh, uh, in this bacteria. So. Um, we've got a potentially very sick patient. It's in the blood. We have to assume that it's resistant to our other antibiotics. So what are we going to use for serious MRSA infections? Well, we're going to use vancomycin. What is an important uh, difference between ampicillin and amoxicillin? So mainly is 
Amoxicillin has better bioavailability uh, when taking PO and less affected by uh, food ingestion. So you're going to always see amoxicillin given uh, PO and almost always will, will you see ampicillin given IV. So, uh, and you'll see this in the pediatric population uh, most of the time, amoxicillin for ear infections, uh, ampicillin used mostly for uh, neonates. Why are gram-negative bacteria resistant to narrow-spectrum penicillin? So not our extended spectrum. This is mainly referring to things like uh, uh, penicillin itself. So gram-negative bacteria, uh, their outer wall binding sites are too small uh, for the narrow-spectrum penicillins to pass. So our gram-negative bacteria basically just keep out the penicillin from penetrating into the inner, uh, inner part of the cell. So that's why they're resistant. That's going to conclude our quick review number one. Let's get back to your main lecturer. So let's think about some of the ways that a bacteria might become resistant to the actions of an antimicrobial agent. So you can imagine that if there's an antimicrobial agent and a bacteria, that the bacteria could try to just keep that antibacterial agent from coming in. Um, and so that's one way, just prevent its entry. Another way would be by deactivating that antimicrobial agent, whether it's in the environment outside of the bacteria or in the environment within that bacteria. A third way might be to keep that antibacterial agent from um, interacting with that bacteria. So change the binding site or the site of action that that antimicrobial would have on the, the uh, bacteria. And a fourth way would be if that antimicrobial agent got in, just to kick it back out again. Um, and so to keep it from uh, exerting any activity over that bacteria. And we see all of these mechanisms of resistance at play within the bacteria um, that we treat with these cell wall inhibitors, these beta lactamase, I mean beta lactam cell wall inhibitors. And so we talked about just keeping that drug from coming in. So there can actually be a decreased permeability to the drug. Gram negative organisms really accomplish this much better by having a decreased penetration of a lot of antimicrobials um, by having that outer cell membrane that has a lipopolysaccharide um, content and it keeps some um, antimicrobials from actually entering through that outer envelope. The second way we talked about is just inactivating that antimicrobial agent. So beta-lactamase is a family of enzymes that hydrolyze the beta-lactam ring. So we talked about the beta-lactam ring being central um, to the activity of penicillins and to all the beta-lactam cell wall inhibitors. And so these beta-lactamases just go in and cleave that beta-lactam ring uh, therefore robbing that antimicrobial of any of its activity. Now some bacteria have a constitutive beta-lactamase production. We had just talked about Klebsiella having um, that constitutive beta-lactamase production. More commonly though, this beta-lactamase is acquired on a plasmid um, wh and where on multiple resistance uh, genes can exist, uh, giving any bacteria that acquires that plasmid, multiple mechanisms of resistance for different antimicrobials. And some antibiotics, um, and cefoxidin has been described in this circumstance, induce the expression of a constitutive beta-lactamase in certain organisms. So the organism might not be producing beta-lactamase, but when it senses a, an antimicrobial there, and in this case it could be a cephalosporin, it will start producing the beta-lactamase. And so that's an inducible beta-lactamase. Some beta-lactams can resist the cleavage by beta, beta-lactamase, and that's where we get these uh, penicillinase-resistant penicillins, such as methicillin that we talked about earlier. They just inherently resist the cleavage by uh, penicillinases, but not by all penicillinases um, or all beta-lactamases. Gram-positive organisms can secrete beta-lactamases extracellularly, so into their environment, and can inactivate uh, these penicillin drugs in their environment, whereas the gram-negative bacteria can find these enzymes to their periplasmic space between the inner and outer membranes, and so the drug actually gets in there, um, and then it's inactivated within that bacteria by the gram-negative. All right, so those were two mechanisms of resistance that we discussed. Now the third would be the altered altered site of action, and for the penicillins, it would be an altered penicillin binding protein. So by altering that penicillin binding protein, what you're doing is reducing the affinity that that protein has for binding the penicillin, and so that you can't achieve the, the concentrations necessary to get um, the, the inhibition of the bacterial growth that you would expect with these drugs. 
Um, and so by altering the penicillin binding proteins, they effecti the effectively keep that antimicrobial from working against that bacteria. And this mechanism may explain the resistance in MRSA that we just talked about. So MRSA, the um, Staphylococcus aureus has changed its binding protein so that methicillin and that whole class of uh, penicillinase resistant penicillins uh, can't bind to that penicillin binding protein and that's the mechanism of resistance for MRSA. All right, and the fourth mechanism of resistance that we talked about, just kicking that drug back out if it does get in, is used um, for bacteria. And it's usually used in something called an efflux pump. And so bacteria can have a pump that actively pumps out certain antimicrobials. It's called an efflux pump, and you will see it um, as the mechanism of resistance for against many antimicrobials. All right, so that's the resistance that we see in penicillins, and you're going to see overlap with other uh, classes of antibiotics as well. Let's move on and talk about the pharmacokinetics of penicillins. And first, let's talk about administration. Some penicillins require parenteral administration or IV injection administration. Penicillin G, ticarcillin, carbenicillin, piperacillin, ampicillin sulbactam, ticarcillin clavulanic acid, and piperacillin tazobactam are all agents that need to be given parenterally. There are also oral agents available, penicillin V, amoxicillin, and amoxicillin clavulanic acid are all oral agents. Some penicillins can be given either by oral or parenteral administration, and these include dicloxacillin, oxacillin, nafcillin, and ampicillin. There are also depot forms of the penicillins. Procaine penicillin G and benzathine penicillin G can both be administered um, intramuscularly and serve as depot forms. So these are then slowly absorbed into the circulation and persist at a low level um, over long periods of time. Unfortunately, these depot forms usually induce a higher rate of adverse effects, and so they aren't used very commonly. Let's discuss absorption of these agents. Most of the penicillins are incompletely absorbed after oral administration, and they reach the intestine, therefore, in sufficient amounts to affect the composition of the intestinal flora. And so this is important for a couple of reasons. One is that we haven't discussed it, but penicillins as a class actually have predictable anaerobic bacterial um, antibacterial activity. And so it not only affects gram positives, in some cases gram negatives, but also anaerobes. And so when you have residual penicillins making their way down the um, intestinal tract that has anaerobic activity, you can understand how it can really change the flora of the intestine um, and cause problems with diarrhea. Another um, point to be made about this uh, incomplete absorption that we see with the penicillins, not only are these penicillins incompletely absorbed, but they also have unpredictable absorption. So we won't be able to tell exactly how much will be absorbed in any patient at a given dose. And this really limits our uses for it. If it's an infection such as a bloodstream infection, a bone infection, meningitis, we really need to reach high levels, um, high plasma concentrations of these drugs. And if they're being incompletely and unpredictably absorbed through the GI tract, then we can't really count on um, giving an oral administration of these drugs to uh, reliably treat these other infections. Now, amoxicillin is completely absorbed or almost completely absorbed, and so therapeutic levels are not supposed to reach the intestinal crypts, and so it does limit its use for the treatment of um, Shigella or Salmonella-derived enteritis because it's not reaching um, the bottom of the, the small intestine or the large intestine to treat these infections. However, um, amoxicillin still causes its fair share of GI upset and diarrhea, and so it just uses other mechanisms to do that. But amoxicillin is fairly well absorbed, unlike many other penicillins. Absorption of all penicillinase-resistant penicillins is decreased by food in the stomach, and because gastric emptying time is, is lengthened, gastric emptying is delayed. And so these drugs can be destroyed in the acidic environment of the stomach. And so they should be administered 30 to 60 minutes before meals or two to three hours after meals. Other penicillins appear to be less affected by food. 
Now let's talk about distribution of these drugs after administration. Beta-lactam antibiotics generally distribute very well throughout the body. All of the penicillins do cross, cross the placental barrier, um, but none of these has been shown to be teratogenic. There is penetration into the bone and CSF, um, but it's much more thorough when these sites are inflamed. The, the penetration into these sites becomes less predictable when the um, infection begins to be treated and the inflammation um, subsides. So during the acute phase of the reaction, inflamed meninges are much more permeable to the penicillins, and so there's an increased ratio of the amount of drug in the central nervous system compared to the amount in the serum. But like I discussed, as that infection and as the inflammation abates, uh, the permeability barriers are reestablished, and so those medicines may not be very successful at treating those infections at the end of that treatment period. And importantly, penicillin levels in the prostate are insufficient to be effective against infections there, so they shouldn't be used for the treatment of prostatitis. Okay, let's uh, talk a little bit about metabolism of the penicillins. Generally, humans don't metabolize beta-lactams. In patients with impaired renal function, some metabolism of penicillin G can occur because the, the uh, kidneys aren't excreting it, it's sitting in the blood and you might see metabolism, uh, but under most in most cases, um, these beta-lactams are excreted. Specifically, they undergo renal excretion. And because you're relying on the kidneys to excrete those antibiotics, you need to be really careful about renal insufficiency and adjust the doses when there is um, renal ins insufficiency. Probenicid inhibits the secretion of penicillins by competing for active tubular secretion via the organic acid transporter and can therefore increase blood levels. Now we can exploit this, and they have historically, by giving pro probenicid to patients who are taking penicillin when there's not um, enough penicillin to go around. So early in penicillin production, there was very limited supplies. They would give probenicid with penicillin to try to um, increase the number of people that could receive the penicillin. We don't really have that problem right now, and so you just really need to remember this as a drug-drug interaction, that probenicid will uh, decrease the excretion of penicillin and can give you toxic um, plasma concentrations. Nafcillin is um, a notable exception to what we're talking about because it's primarily excreted through the biliary route. And because it is, it may cause biliary sludging or gallstones. And so if um, somebody is having these symptoms while they're on nafcillin, you're going to have to remember that nafcillin is primarily excreted through the biliary route and can cause complications there. But nafcillin can be very useful then in patients who have renal insufficiency or renal failure because this is another um, route by which uh, the penicillin can be excreted. Penicillins are also excreted into breast milk, so you need to remember that with lactating women. All right, let's move on to adverse reactions of the penicillins. Penicillins are generally extremely safe. Uh, they have very wide use and have been successful um, at treating many people for many reasons. However, there are some well-recognized adverse effects that you need to know and remember. The most important adverse effect um, of the penicillins is hypersensitivity. The major antigenic determinant of hypersensitivity is penicilloic acid, which is a metabolite that reacts with proteins, and that's um, what serves as a haptin to cause that immune reaction. Approximately 5% of patients will have some reaction to penicillins. The most common might be a maculopapular rash, um, and this is seen more with ampicillin, especially in patients who are taking ampicillin while they have mononucleosis. Uh, about almost 100% of people who are given ampicillin while they have um, mononucleosis will experience a maculopapular rash. And you just need to know that if that happens, they can still take ampicillin safely um, outside of their mononucleosis episode. Angioedema can also occur, and, um, which is characterized by marked swelling of the lips, tongue, and periorbital -orb area, and this can be very dangerous for patients. And of course, anaphylaxis is probably the most dreaded reaction that we see with penicillins. Now, cross-allergic reactions can occur amongst the other beta-lactam antibiotics. Another adverse reaction that we see frequently with the penicillins is diarrhea. This is primarily due to the disruption of normal GI flora balance because like we talked about, um, the oral penicillins are incompletely absorbed and can change the flora of the whole bowel um, and can cause problems related to that.
This is usually a bigger problem if the drugs are incompletely absorbed or if they have a very broad spectrum. If they do have great activity against gram positive, gram negative, and anaerobes, you can imagine how they could wipe out the, the gut flora. Nephritis is another adverse um, reaction to penicillins. All penicillins can have this adverse um, reaction, but methicillin um, has the potential of causing acute interstitial nephritis. So methicillin is no longer available clinically, and this is the reason, uh, but it is still used, like I said, in the lab to determine sensitivity to this group of antibiotics. Neurotoxicity is another side effect that we need to worry about. Um, and penicillins can provoke seizure, seizures. This happens more if they're injected intrathecally, or that means directly into the CSF, or if very high blood levels are reached. So how might we, re we reach very high blood levels of penicillins in our patients? Well, you could give the wrong dose, um, and that doesn't happen. Usually you give standard doses, but the primary way that this happens is by not watching the renal function, and so if you don't adjust um, the initial dose for that patient's renal function, you can give them a toxic dose. Also, if their renal function changes over the course of their antibiotics, they can gradually have increasing plasma concentrations and then have a lot of these adverse effects that wouldn't otherwise happen. And neurotoxicity is definitely one that's associated with very high blood levels. Epileptic patients or patients with a seizure history are particularly at risk for these neuro this neurotoxicity. And so again, always watch the serum creatinine levels and then adjust, adjust the dose as necessary. Hematologic toxicities are also a problem. Coagulopathy can be seen with the anti-pseudomonal penicillins, um, carbenicillin, ticarcillin, and with penicillin G. Um, these can cause patients to have both platelet dysfunction and thrombocytopenia. So you need to exercise caution in patients who are predisposed to hemorrhage or if they're receiving anticoagulants. If they have some other reason to bleed, then you'll want to watch um, the use of penicillins in these patients. It can cause hemolytic anemia um, or eosinophilia, but both of these side effects are rare with the penicillins. It can also cause electrolyte derangement. Um, penicillins are generally administered as either a sodium or a potassium salt, and so toxicities can be related to these large quantities of sodium or potassium that you'll give patients when you give them uh, penicillin drugs. Sodium excess may actually cause hypokalemia, so you can induce an electrolyte abnormality that way. But there's also just underlying comorbidities that you have to watch for. So if a person has fluid overload, if they have CHF, you might not want to give them a sodium load and increase their, the fluid um, that they're experiencing that they, for whatever reason, they can't get rid of. If they have renal failure, and so they're very sensitive to potassium and to hyperkalemia, then you'll want to be really careful about the, the penicillin salts um, that contain um, potassium. And some of this can be avoided by just using the most potent medication that you can. Um, by using the most potent antibiotic, you can really uh, lower the dose of, of the antibiotic and then the accompanying um, cations, sodium or potassium. Now let's pause for a moment and review the material that was just covered. Before we do that, if you haven't already done so, this might be a good time to read your pharmacology text that corresponds to the material that was just discussed. Then together, we'll go through the quick review in the study guide. What is the major cause of bacterial resistance to penicillin? You. Yes, you, I'm talking to you. The major cause of penicillin resistance is beta-lactamase production. Pay attention. I'm not doing this just to hear myself talk. I do this because I love teaching. All right, we're back. Let's do quick review number two. As an inpatient, a post-op patient is being given IV ampicillin and sulbactam. Soon after the first dose of medication, the patient begins to have a generalized rash and wheezing. What is the treatment uh, for an anaphylactic reaction? So that's what we're saying here is that this is probably an anaphylactic uh, reaction. Well, uh, first things first, when anything uh, uh, is going to um, potentially affect a, a patient mortally, uh, meaning the patient might die, the first thing you think about are your ABCs. Think of your airway, think of breathing, think of circulation. So anytime you feel uh, like someone's life is in danger, always go back to those uh, uh, life support uh, mnemonics. 
So first, oxygen. You might need to intubate the patient. If they're wheezing to the point where they can't get air, then you always want to protect the airway. Uh, so think about uh, intubation and oxygen. Uh, epinephrine uh, is probably the first thing you're going to try to give someone. It's going to open up their airway. It's going to help counteract uh, that, that anaphylaxis. Antihistamines like diphenhydramine uh, will also help decrease that histamine release that's spurring on a lot of this uh, allergy. And you can also use H2 blockers, though they're not used quite as often, but you can use things like ranitidine and cimetidine, and that's just sort of an extra help to, to decrease this allergic response. Next, what is acute interstitial nephritis? Um, so this question seems to almost kind of come out of uh, nowhere, but, uh, but we'll explain it here in a second. So, it's a form of nephritis affecting the interstitium of the kidney, so the name itself just describes what it is. Now, symptoms are sometimes vague. You can have a rash, you can have nausea, maybe some fever, maybe uh, upset stomach. Um, it's not real specific to the uh, acute interstitial nephritis. But on the labs, uh, you'll, see, you'll see acute renal failure, and that's probably the biggest thing. You start uh, a patient on, on a medication, and then all of a sudden they've got acute renal failure. Uh, but you're also going to see uh, things in their urine as well. So you can often see urine RBCs, uh, WBCs, WBC uh, casts. So you get these white blood cell casts in there. You can even get uh, urine e uh, eosinophils, uh, and you can even get serum uh, eosinophil elevation, so uh, eosinophilia. And the most common cause is drugs. Um, so you can get this uh, real impressive acute renal failure uh, as, as a result of drugs. So let's go to the next question. What drugs are most commonly associated with acute interstitial nephritis? So this is where it, it, it makes sense in, a, in our um, uh, uh, lecture day. So NSAIDs, uh, and including the COX-2 inhibitors, and penicillins. Penicillins are some of the biggest causes of acute interstitial nephritis, and that's why you need to be aware of that. If you give someone uh, a penicillin, and all of a sudden their creatinine bumps way up high, then you need to think, well, oh my gosh, maybe this is acute interstitial uh, nephritis. Cephalosporins, rifampin, sulfa drugs, uh, ciprofloxacin, and some of the other quinolones, uh, perhaps. Cimetidine, which is an H2 blocker. Allopurinol, which is used for gout. Proton pump inhibitors, which are used all the time for gastroesophageal reflux disease. And indenivir, which is an uh, antiviral. So always be aware that um, you can affect the kidneys pretty severely. So most of the time, for treatment purposes, uh, you just have to stop uh, the offending drug. So if you stop the drug, watch the, the kidneys improve, and that's usually about all you have to do. Occasionally, you have to put someone on steroids uh, to help counteract some of the problems, but most of the time, just stopping the medication will, will get you where you need to be. Next. Explain the mechanisms of penicillin resistance. So this is real important. So first is the beta-lactamase activity. So enzymes hydrolyze the cyclic uh, amide uh, bond of the beta-lactam ring. So uh, enzymes are either uh, being spewed out by our gram-positive uh, bacteria or trapped in between the cell membranes of the gram-negative bacteria, and it's actually just beating up on our penicillins, breaking up those rings, and it's no longer effective. Decreased permeability to drugs. So decreased penetration of the antibiotic through the outer cell membrane prevents the drug from reaching the target penicillin binding proteins. So if you can't get the drug into the cell, the cell can't kill. Um, so uh, it can't get to those penicillin uh, binding proteins and, and therefore you're just not, not killing the cell. Next is altered penicillin binding protein. So um, remember how that penicillin is going to come in. It's going to bind to those proteins on the cell wall. It's going to inhibit that process, inhibit the synthesis of, uh, of the cell wall, uh, and that's how we break these things down. What side effect is seen when a patient with mononucleosis is given an amino penicillin? So this is a great question. Um, so someone comes in, they have mono, you give them an amino penicillin like amoxicillin, uh, and what happens? Well, they break out in this uh, maculopapular rash, this real pretty full body pinkish rash. It doesn't really bother the patient so much, but it can be impressive and it can really frighten them. So why is this happening? Well, about 99% of people who have mono who get amino penicillins are going to get this rash. It happens fairly regularly uh, because mono looks a lot like strep throat. So you get this exudative pharyngitis, you get lymphadenopathy and fever, you feel bad. So uh, they look a lot alike. So um, you give them the uh, amoxicillin, they break out in the rash, and what, do, what, what will a patient think at that point? Well, I'm allergic to penicillins, therefore I should never take penicillins again. So um, it can be a, a real big bummer because we have a lot of people who think they're allergic to penicillin, and this is sort of adding to that as well, is that we're, we're treating people with too many antibiotics um, for presumptive uh, infections, and then they get a reaction, and then they automatically think they're, they're um, allergic to the medication. So what makes things worse is that uh, about 20% of patients with mono will also have strep throat. So 
someone comes in, they have uh, exudative pharyngitis, you swab them. Oh, they've got, they've got uh, strep, therefore I'm going to give them uh, an amino penicillin, get them all fixed up and, and ready to go. Well, 20% of those people might have mono as well. So they get the rash and they go, oh no, I'm allergic, and you kind of see where this is going. So some will argue that you don't want to use amino penicillins for strep throat. Uh, you can use regular uh, penicillins, uh, which won't cause this reaction. Um, sometimes this can be more difficult in, say, our pediatric patients because amoxicillin tastes pretty good, and for compliance reasons, we often use that medication uh, uh, for a lot of pediatric infections. So just be aware of mono and rashes uh, with amino penicillins. What is a super infection? So is this an infection that's just more impressive than all other infections? Well, not really. So uh, a super infection is an infection that develops while treating another infection. So let's go over an example. So our extended spectrum penicillins that we use all the time, our amoxicillin, our ampicillin, will kill normal endogenous gut flora uh, while allowing other bacteria to overgrow in the area. So um, this can lead to an infection called pseudomembranous colitis. And this is just one example. There's also other types of, of super infections as well. So the bacteria involved uh, is, is called Clostridium difficile. So you have this infection that's going on, say it's an ear infection, you give them an antibiotic, it's killing off normal stuff. Uh, other bacteria that shouldn't be in the gut starts being uh, able to overgrow in the area and you get this secondary infection. So that's what a super infection is. Um, it can happen in other situations as well. Uh, you can take other broad spectrum antibiotics and women will often get uh, yeast infections and they'll need an antifungal or something else going on. It's important to know that um, the antibiotic that you're originally giving uh, will not treat this second infection. That's why it's able to grow. So in the case of yeast, obviously an antibiotic is not going to treat that yeast infection. Um, so Clostridium difficile is, is a pretty famous uh, bacteria that, that can cause pseudomembranous colitis. What other antibiotic is, is real notorious for the C. diff colitis uh, scenario? Well, that's going to be clindamycin, so remember that for testing as well. And another question, what are we going to use to kill off C. diff colitis? Well, this is going to be an opportunity to use oral vancomycin. Remember, we use IV vancomycin all the time for uh, really impressive, severe uh, staph infections. And this is the one situation where you're going to use oral vancomycin. Oral vancomycin does not uh, get absorbed in, uh, by the gut, so it stays in the gut and it kills whatever's in there. But also you should know is that we use uh, metronidazole a bit more often for uh, C. diff colitis uh, because we want to maintain our vancomycin and not expose it too often to developing potential resistances. Next, by what mechanism is MRSA resistant to penicillin? So MRSA everywhere in the world we're getting boils with MRSA, people are getting all sorts of infections that are serious. Um, how is it uh, avoiding our penicillins? Well, it's through the altered penicillin binding proteins. So uh, remember, that's uh, where the penicillins will bind to the cell membrane and start uh, uh, messing up the uh, synthesis of the, of the cell membrane. Why would nafcillin be useful in a patient with renal failure? Well, remember that nafcillin is excreted in the bile. Uh, therefore, it does not need to be renally dosed. Unfortunately, the uh, nafcillin uh, can cause a potential side effect of gallstones. And that's going to be the end of our quick review number two. Now's a good time to pause the video and complete the in-session quiz, then restart the video and we'll go through the quiz together. All right, we've made it to the end of session quiz. Let's get started. What is the mechanism of action for the penicillins? Uh, well, we've gone over this a couple times now, but remember, it interferes with the final step of bacterial cell wall synthesis. Um, so it's binding to those penicillin binding protein. Uh, it leaves the cell membrane exposed, so it's kind of opening things up, and then cells will lyse by osmotic uh, pressure or via autolysis. Explain how the addition of clavulanic acid to amoxicillin helps kill a resistant organism. Well, remember that uh, clavulanic acid is a penicillinase uh, inhibitor, or a uh, beta-lactamase inhibitor. Uh, so the addition allows that penicillin uh, to be less affected by uh, bacteria that have that beta-lactamase activity. Which penicillin drug would you use uh, uh, given the following infection? So syphilis. Remember we talked about syphilis. What do we use? Well, we're going to use our plain-jane penicillin, our IV penicillin. UTI. Uh, 
though this is not the first line for a, a UTI infection, but if we're talking about which penicillin we're going to use, you're going to use your amino penicillins. Because remember, uh, those amino penicillins or extended spectrum uh, penicillins will cover uh, more gram-negative rods. All right, which penicillin are we going to use for Pseudomonas? Uh, well, you could potentially use uh, carboxy penicillin. Uh, there's some others that we can use as well. Uh, neonatal infection, uh, you're going to use a combination of ampicillin and gentamicin. And we'll talk a, a little bit more at length uh, in a later question about that. MSSA infection, what does that mean? Well, that's methicillin-sensitive staph aureus. We've been talking about MRSA a lot, but MSSA infections are still out there. And you can use uh, one of your staphylococcal uh, antibiotics, something like nafcillin or dicloxacillin. Match each drug with its characteristic. So uh, let's talk about uh, dicloxacillin. It's an anti-staphylococcal. Ampicillin is an amino penicillin. Ticarcillin is an anti-pseudomonal. Penicillin G is the uh, IV form of penicillin, and penicillin V is the oral form of penicillin. What are the adverse effects of the penicillins? Um, in general, we should, we should men mention that the penicillins are very well tolerated. Uh, you're not going to run into a lot of problems, um, but there are some minor ones that you need to, to be aware of. Hypersensitivity is the big one. You will see so many different types of percentages and numbers about how many people are actually um, allergic to penicillin. Um, some will say 5%, some will say 20%. You know, it's re it really varies widely. You'll find in practice that people more often than not will think they're allergic to penicillin when they really aren't. But you'll get maculopapular rash, angioedema, uh, but potentially anaphylaxis. So it is a big deal. If someone really has a true uh, anaphylactic uh, reaction to penicillin, you really want to avoid it from then on. Minor things like uh, diarrhea, uh, nephritis, remember we talked about that, that acute interstitial nephritis, so um, if, if someone is having unusual symptoms, uh, you might want to check their, their uh, renal function. Neurotoxicity is rare, uh, hematologic toxicities are rare, uh, and then you can also get some electrolyte derangement. Name the, bat, uh, the beta lactamase inhibitors, so remember that's clavulanic acid, sulbactam, and tazobactam. Describe the difference between how gram-positive and gram-negative bacteria use the beta-lactamases. So that's how they're going to uh, become more resistant to the penicillins. So the gram-positive organisms secrete beta-lactamase uh, extracellularly. So they're kind of shooting out right around their cell, uh, hoping to catch uh, that penicillin before it binds to their cell wall or to their cell membrane. Where uh, the gram-negative bacteria uh, can find the enzyme in the periplasmic space between the inner and the outer membrane. So they kind of hold on to it. So if a penicillin does happen to get through their membrane, which they don't do that often because, remember, those membranes are, are tougher to get through for, for penicillins, uh, it's going to use that beta-lactamase to inactivate it as well. What two antibiotics are often used for neonatal sepsis? So uh, here's an example of uh, an amino penicillin and an amino glycoside used together. So this is an interesting scenario. It doesn't happen that often uh, with other combinations of medicines. But these two will work synergistically together. So you add these two together, and they're going to kill more bacteria than either one of them they would, as they would alone. So this is not the only reason to use these. I mean, for neonatal sepsis, we want to use some strong antibiotics because this is a serious life-threatening condition. So that synergism is uh, very helpful to kill extra bacteria. Uh, but you're also helping uh, uh, by combining to uh, increase the spectrum. So uh, the amino penicillins are going to cover your gram positives. Your uh, gentamicin will not cover uh, gram positives. So that's an important distinction. Now, we've talked about how the extended spectrum Penicillins will cover gram negatives, and that's great, but you probably don't want to hang your hat on that too much. Um, you don't want to go into a really serious gram negative uh, infection just with an amino penicillin going, well, this is obviously going to kill everything off. And that's why we're also adding in this, uh, this gentamicin, because gentamicin is, is specifically um, used for um, serious gram negative infection. So they kind of help extend each other's spectrum, uh, but then that synergism is also very helpful uh, to help kill off uh, really strong infections. Next, a 22-year-old patient develops a rash after uh, she was given amoxicillin for a severe sore throat. What are the two probable scenarios for this reaction? So I'm making you think a little bit outside the box on this one. So I didn't say that she had strep throat. I just said she had a severe sore throat. So what I'm trying to get you to think about here is, well, she's getting a rash. So one, is she allergic to penicillin drugs? So she gets a drug like amoxicillin. She has a rash. Maybe this is hypersensitivity. That could be what's going on. So you need to think about that. 
Second, well, if you didn't actually check for strep throat, this patient maybe has mononucleosis because it can really look similarly. So they take the amoxicillin, they have mononucleosis, boom, you get your rash again and, and it can trick you. So always think about that if you have sort of an unconfirmed sore throat, you're throwing an amino penicillin, which you probably shouldn't do. Um, think about that, that potential for mononucle mononucleosis and, and try not to immediately just grasp her. Well, she's obviously uh, uh, allergic to this medication. Next. What bacteria are covered by the extended spectrum penicillin? So we went over this in a previous question. Let's, let's go over it one more time because you're going to get questions on this for sure. Um, so first, don't forget gram-positive bacteria. Getting that gram-positive bacteria um, in, in most cases, and that's why we use it for a lot of uh, upper respiratory infections. But gram-negative rods is also important to remember. Remember, it's HELPS, H-E-L-P-S. So Haemophilus influenza, E. coli. Listeria, remember, the amino penicillins uh, are the drugs of choice for listeria, and you're going to see listeria in your neonatal patients. Proteus mirabilis, uh, seen often in UTI, salmonella, enterococci. So remember all those with your helps and to really know your coverage for your extended spectrum uh, penicillins. Well, that's going to end our end of session quiz. Uh, I hope you learned something, and good luck studying.